Welcome to our final session of the Toronto International Film Festival's Industry Conference. Thank you so much for supporting us from around the world in a very different year. My name is Jeff McNaughton, and I'm the Senior Director of Industry and Theatrical here at TIFF. As you join us, we encourage you to reflect on the land that you are on, who the traditional keepers of the land are, what the treaty relationship is, or if it's unceded territory. TIFF is located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. The territory is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and is home to many First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and Métis people. We are grateful to work on this land. We'd also like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major industry supporters, Telefilm Canada and Ontario Creates. Over the last five days, we've witnessed what distributors are buying, and they're still buying this content, with sales like Brews, Pieces of a Woman, and Night of Kings, and many other films in and out of official selection. We watch festivals collaborate in unprecedented ways for the love of cinema. We learn from creators who are telling original and impactful stories amidst an industry that is coming to terms with its own systemic inequalities. We heard from champions whose personal and organizational mission is to fight this imbalance on a daily basis. We've celebrated their successes and acknowledged that there are enormous strides still to be made and everyone has a part to play. TIFF, our speakers, our moderators, and you, the audience. Don't let what you've heard over the last five days be forgotten. Continue to be an inspired under these extraordinary circumstances. Ensure the words become actions and hold those who have decision-making power accountable. We are all part of the same ecosystem and path to recovery. It really takes a village to produce this conference. And this year was a whole new layer of resourcefulness and empathy and technical ingenuity that made it possible. We'd like to thank our amazing team, including um, our industry programming producer, Jane Kim, manager of industry sales, Brittany Allen, manager of industry services, Erica Loyola, associate programmer, Steph Guthrie and Anita Tavakal, our production teams, Julia Shanghavi, Aaron Fitzgerald, Susan Edwards, and Angela Coates, as well as the producing team at Paragon, our platform provider. Everything you've seen over the last five days is because of them. We really felt like the best way to close our conference this year was to hear from three directors on the evolution of their creative voices, the art of collaboration, and their leadership philosophies. Guiding this conversation is TIFF Ambassador and Director of the Farewell, Lulu Wong. Lulu, the stage is yours to close out this year's conference. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Lulu Wong and I'm gonna be moderating this TIFF Dialogue, uh, Directors in Conversation. Uh, I am a writer director myself. Um, my recent film is The Farewell, which uh, premiered last year at Sundance. Uh, and I'm gonna introduce two incredible filmmakers. Um, the first one is Rada Blank, uh, who is a native New Yorker, performer and writer for TV, stage and film, whose directorial debut, The 40-Year-Old Version, won the US Dramatic Competition Directing Award at Sundance. Welcome, Rada. Hey, nice to virtually meet you, Lulu. I'm such a fan of your work. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk about your film and your process. Um, I feel like it's so meta, like so many of the things I want to talk about as far as career and voice, like you explore in the film as well. Um, cool. And so, yeah, welcome. Um, the next filmmaker is writer-director Stella McGee, known for Gene of the Joneses, The Photograph, and the recently announced Whitney Houston biopic, I Want to Dance with Somebody. Hi. Hey, Stella. Hi. Hi. Hey, Hey, I've never moderated before. I just have to let you know. I feel like I'm normally the one asking the question. Um, so I, let's just keep it really casual. I just, um, 
Sure. You know, I want us to all talk and hopefully be informative for aspiring filmmakers, working filmmakers out there. Um, and first, I guess, let's start with um, how are you dealing with all of this? What's your process? Do you have a process? Have you been able to be creative and productive? If so, please give me advice on how you're able to do that because I found it very challenging. I mean, for me, it's been in intermittent, I think, like weeks and maybe months of just doing nothing, um, um, of just trying to keep your mental health, you know, in check. Uh, and then, you know, spurts of, oh, I really should, that deadline was like last year, I should. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you're both writers. I was going to say, does it, like, do you feel the pressure to be developing in this moment? Because that's mostly what we're able to do. I don't. No. <laughs> you I don't. No. I don't feel pressured because, well, I, you know, at one point I felt a certain pressure around my purpose. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when the, when the epidemic first hit, I was like, and I'm arguing over scene notes, you know, like I really had to hone in on like what, what it is that I do and, and what does it mean to the world? So for a second, I was just like, okay, maybe when the pandemic clears up, I'll go back to school and get another degree and <laughs> become a teacher or something. I don't know. But what um, out of the pandemic and, and, and trying to deal, you know, like Stella said, keeping, trying to keep some stable mental health. Like I was watching a lot of content and I really appreciated being an audience member in that moment, just like needing the catharsis mm -hmm. or the escape and um, getting to uh, revisit or rediscover or movies I'd seen years ago or see shows I didn't have time to see before. And um, it really did make me appreciate the role of the, of the storyteller in a time like this, because, you know, it's not bad to get a little escape, you know what I'm saying? When, you know, it's like raining cats yeah. and dogs and this smoke and fire outside, you know, to just have something to keep you, help you maintain your man, your, 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 your sanity, I should say. Um, but yeah, I haven't felt pressured because um, I just, I think I just wanted to make sure I made it out okay mentally. That was my priority so that I could write someday. You know what I mean? I don't know about you guys, but that's where I was. Yeah. I feel like it's hard to write when you're not like ex having new experiences as well. Right. Like, what are we going to write about being trapped in a room? I mean, I, it's, it's, I agree with you. It's like, I need to, people inspire a lot of my writing and I can't really, or at least I couldn't really engage with people. Like I, I ride the subway a lot in New York and I wouldn't get on nobody's subway. In fact, I haven't been on a subway since March because mm -hmm. I'm so nervous about, you know, but yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I find that it's hard too because you know I have projects that I set up before the pandemic, and then with um, the lockdown and everything going on in the world, it's like, wait, do, does that subject still matter? And it's almost like you have to reframe it in our current context. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. don't know what the post, you know, COVID of it all is going to look like yet in in various industry, various worlds, and so it's hard to like reframe and predict the future but you can't you it's like nobody cares about the past anymore like so many of the worlds i was exploring was like a thing of the past um and rada mm -hmm. you talk about your purpose and and having you know pressure f figuring that out have you I and mean, both of you sort of reassess like you know what is your purpose or how have you um come to terms with what your purpose is and how has this period sort of force you to relook at your, reframe your purpose, if at all, I guess? Yeah, I mean, for me, being an observer, being an audience member of all of that content, and it's a lot, I'm still taking some of it in, really did uh, help me recenter myself and feel even more fortified in, in the role of a storyteller, because so much of that story got me through. So I'm I'm back to center. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, I don't feel guilty about, <laughs> you know, um, fighting for the length of a film or, you know, mm -hmm. wanting a little extra budget so things show up on the screen that I need. I don't 
feel bad about that because I know that it's it is going to feed somebody somewhere, you know. So I I feel back to myself, you know, back to this new role as director. What about you, um, Stella? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I feel like you take in so much in the like moments during this pandemic where, especially the live stuff, has kind of fortified me. So like, you know, even when it was like the Last Dance or um, mm. you know um, Michaela Cole's new show, like seeing Ooh. stuff like that reminded me like, you know, especially as you're watching and consuming so much, you know, there's still not necessarily a lot of content of people that look like me, you know? So it's mm. like that, um, those things are reminders to just like, you know, keep 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 on the path you're on, keep writing mm. characters, these leading women, um, because there's just so much more to explore in those lives that hasn't, you know, been seen. So um, when I feel like writing, <laughs> I'll continue to write um, yeah. you know, more of those stories. But for now, it's been fun to be able to like, Go because I feel like through the pandemic, it's like you're going through different modes of watching things too. You know, I'll mm -hmm. be like, oh, I'm watching everything I didn't catch up on, I, everything I haven't seen in the past year. And then there was a moment where I was like watching all my favorite movies again, yeah. like that gave me comfort of things I'd already seen that had inspired me. So you're like, oh, right, like getting closer to kind of your initial instincts um, of filmmaking and, and what you like. So it's been, um, you know, I think I think good to be able to just have the time to kind of remember why you're doing what you do and um, and and like be missing set, you know, and be be like, you know, I'm doing like a pre prep for like Whitney Houston, and it's like just just getting excited about like, oh, I can't wait to go back to set. I can't wait to be um, working again to remind yourself, like, yeah, I really do, you know, love my job. And do you? You know, I, I want to talk a little bit about when when you're in the thick of it, you know, I, I know, Rada, you just came off of um, your Sundance dance premiere and Stella and I have talked about this before, um, having gone from independent to studio back to independent, you know, I'm really enjoying this break. Um, but I, when I think back on all of the battles that I had to fight and I'm gearing up to go back into battle, um, you know, you need a lot of motivation and what you talk about, like, there's not a lot of stuff out there that with people that look like us, you know? And so mm -hmm. it is a, it's, it's a constant battle of dealing with people from different backgrounds and producers and financiers. And so I want you guys to talk a little bit about how you're able to do things on your own terms or, you know, mm what those steps are, um, what the challenges of that are, and how, like, how do you get yourself through those moments? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Rada, your your movie deals with this so much of like when you are when you sell out and, uh, and how that feels. And so it's, but it's not always so black and white, right? We also have to pick our battles. Mm -hmm. So how do you pick those battles? And, and yeah, and who do you talk to to get through those moments? Um, Stella, Stella is somebody I've talked to <laughs> because she's been through this four times, five times, Stella. Already. Okay. But, okay. And as someone who's made more than one film, you know, it's not like there aren't still battles, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. um, what I find is that the, people are just not used to us being in power. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. And so there's always a challenge. Um, it always feels like you have to convince somebody that what you want to do could work, mm. you know, um, that it's, it, for, and I'm talking about people outside of my producing team. I'm going to talk about them in a second <laughs> because I do think that that is important. Like the, the people closest to you have to believe in these crazy ideas as much as you do. But I just mean in terms of everyone else, you know, like, it, it, it you when you talk to people you can tell that they're kind of calculating what the risk is mm -hmm. of going on betting on you and that's what happened for six years um in different iterations where people were like yeah but maybe you shouldn't be in it 
Oh, okay, but but how about not black and white? Um, mm, do you maybe put Tiffany Haddish? You know, like all of these things that people were doing to kind of minimize mm -hmm. the risk. Whereas my current producers at Hillman Grad, it was a no brainer. And I think it's because they look like me. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I do think it's important um, to in this idea of going to battle is is having mm -hmm. people who can get behind your ideas. Um, that's not always someone who looks like you, but it might be more possible because mm -hmm. they have been in your situation. I feel like someone like Nina and, and, and someone like Rishi, you know, it wasn't, it was a no brainer because they are, you know, people of color, they're queer, they're on the margins. And so, you know, I think for me moving forward, it, it's important that I just have people who understand maybe what it is to ask people, ask something of people who don't look like me, if that makes sense. And I don't, it, it's not about, because we could talk about race and unpack that at some point. I mean, now seems to be the time, like we're in a time of reckoning, I think. But I feel like for me, what guaranteed that my voice uh, was heard more was to have the support of people who had no problem with the sound, the timber, the color of my voice. They had no problem with it. And so I, from that standpoint, I just had more support going in. Um, but that's probably why it took as long as it did is because for everyone else, it was such a risk, you know? And I had to find, I had to align with people who didn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so, that that is the key. Like the, I feel like the more I work, it's just like the more selective you get about who you're willing to make your work with um, because the, the experiences can just be night and day depending on if you really have that support system around you of people who get you, who believe in you. You know, it is the difference between a great time and a nightmare for two years, you know? So um, it's important to be able to find the people that really want to make the same movie you want to make um, yeah. and are going to trust you whether it's your first time or your 20th time and for women filmmakers especially like there is a version where it doesn't matter what number of films you make you, you still show up and people still think you do not know what you're talking about um and they're shocked that you're like a real director or whatever. And there's, <laughs> there's just always that moment where you're like, oh, okay, finally this clicked in like on this particular conversation, right. realizing that this is not an after school special and you are here because you've worked hard and you're good at your job. But um, uh, what was the original question? <laughs> well, I mean, just, just, like how you deal with those battles, right? And I mean, oh, after right, many, right. Many as you have, it's, yeah. it's about the team because yeah. I've been through yeah, that, that's a huge thing of it. But it's like you really have to trust your gut because you really could be um, with great people who are just throwing out ideas at you, and you really have to know where your line is and remember what story you're trying to tell. And right. um, I feel like I always say, like, you just have to not be afraid to be the bad guy. You know, like, Ooh. I'm happy to be the bad guy if I need to be the bad guy. And sometimes you're not even being the bad guy. You're just saying no, um, you which makes you the bad guy in their eyes. So I just don't concern myself with that in particular. I try to just remember what I want to do. Because the times that I haven't listened to myself and I've compromised, you know, you're the one who can't watch your movie back. That's right. You know, you're the one who, when that scene comes on, you're just like, ugh, like, why? You know, that? Like, you know, just to be nice, you know, just to be. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I, I feel like I'm just, just over that. Like, I think you just have to trust yourself and just be willing to say no, just be willing to say the bad guy, even if it's like every single time. Because I've had, I've had directors tell me that before, like, you know, I was like, why did you agree to that? And they're like, I just wanted to show I was collaborative. And I'm like, don't, <laughs> because the one time you say no, they will think you're not collaborative. So mm -hmm. you saying no on this particular thing isn't gonna give you brownie points when you say no two days from now. You know, right. just say yes if you, you know, collaborate and be 
compromising if you think it makes sense um, and it's not going to change what you want. But if, if it is, then there's just no point to it. Yeah, I always tell um, people who are working with uh, people who don't look like them, like think of all of the different ways in which you can basically say, you don't come from where I come from. Mm -hmm. But like you, like I found myself, and I find all the time, um, you know, in a collaborative way, but trying to rephrase that for same phrase over and over of saying, okay, but the perspective is different, and this is why. Like mm -hmm. this is not a, this is not necessarily a story note. This is a cultural note. This right. is, you know, and we have to differentiate that where it's not bad. It's you just don't get it. And right. so. Um, I've a lot of mother characters. A lot of I have a lot of mother daughter relationships, and I feel like I'll always get that note from someone who's yeah. not in my culture. Like, why is she so mean? Why do they hate each other? Why? Why does she talk to her like that? And I'm like, Can't you just say I love you. The way a Jamaican mother talks to you, like, there's no other version of it. I've never seen anyone with a different version, like. This is love, you know. Right. I mean, it's not match what your version of mother daughter love is, but that that's what my version is, and it's not cold. You know, they don't hate each other. This is just how it works. Like this is just how they interact with each other. Um, this is how love is shown. Um, and I'm sorry for you if you don't get that. I I I've dealt with some some of the stuff uh, regarding the. Um, Audio version um, around the relationship between Rada and D. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've had s several people who weren't from the culture say, "I just I, does he really like her? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not mm -hmm. seeing it." And and um, then I, you know, I show the movie to a room full of black women, and you know, the minute he comes from around <laughs> that turntable, <laughs> all of them go, mm -hmm. "You know what I mean?" It's just this thing of like trusting that it speaks speaks to someone, you know, and that someone making you the first audience, that yeah. someone who looks and feels like you is going to get it. And if other people don't, it's okay. Like, what I think is interesting about that, though, is, you know how we're always encouraged to write the universal, be specific to write the universal. But sometimes I watch movies where there's no connection between me and the character, and I still love the movie. Right. I still love it. I can watch... 12 Angry Men, a film about aliens. I can watch all kinds of films where the person doesn't look like me. I haven't had that personal experience. And sometimes I want us to encourage that side of viewing too. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't have to necessarily have a way in to just respect that yeah. somebody's having a different experience. Right. And I feel like it's always told, I, I mean, from when I, when I talk to my filmmaker friends who are of color, we're always told, right? universally make sure there's a way in but i'm always like a way in for who you know yeah. what i mean because as a person in my 40s who's been watching films forever it wasn't until later you know uh or i don't know 60s and 70s i started seeing more and more people of color on film but i've watched a lot of films i've seen a lot of tv programming where i wasn't there i wasn't of that experience and i enjoyed it Mm -hmm. So it's so interesting when we're always encouraged to write universal characters when that's not always why you like a film. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I like a film with, with, a, with a person, you know, I saw First Cow and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I'm not a cow. I mean, people may call me one, but I'm not a cow. I'm not a merchant. I didn't right. live in the 1700s. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? I'm not immigrant, you know, so... um I don't know how I got on that tangent, but <laughs> no, but it's a great point. Are, no, I mean, I, 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 I you, you talking about this reminds me of just traveling, right? When we used to travel, mm -hmm. it's not the responsibility of the people living in that country, that city, that town, to make their lives universal, so that when you right. travel in there with your Patagonia backpack, you're like, look, right. I, right. no, it's your job. To go there respectfully, and right. and and, Do the and work, yeah, and not hinder, and you may not even agree with the way they live their lives or whatever, but that's you're not there to judge, you're not there to change them, mm -hmm. you're there to view and to have a different yeah. experience mm -hmm. and to learn. Mm -hmm. 
And so you guys talk about um, how important it is to, you know, have the right partners. And I can't name the number, I can't number, I can't, I can't decide on the number of times I've um, told young filmmakers who don't have that many choices where they uh, are like, well, I don't have options. This is my option. What do I do? You know, and I, I didn't go to film school. Rada, I know you didn't go to film school. Like, so I've always been envious of people who went to film school because it seems like they came into the industry with their tribe and people that they yeah. worked with and start mm -hmm. from the bottom up. I didn't have that. So I'm curious um, what your advice is to people, both of you on, you know, how did you find your people um, if you have, or maybe you're still continuing to find that team that you want to keep working with. But, you know, I think that um, I read something, Rada, where you said, like, go where the love is, right? And I think Isare um, said something like, when you network, it's not about networking up, it's about networking across. Mm -hmm. And so when you don't go to film school, how do you do that? How have you guys uh, been able to find your people? I mean, I think it's like one person leads to another because I came, I was in Toronto, you know, um, I went to school in London, so I didn't really have that base here. Uh, and I, and it was really like one person led to another, like one assistant manager, one assistant to a producer in Toronto introduced me to a manager, introduced me, and like one friend introduced me to an agent um, to help me cast a movie I didn't even make, but helped me get the manager to agree to sign me. I feel like it's just like you, you try to create meaningful relationships, even if it's one at a time. And hopefully that will lead you into like a circle of other filmmakers. Um, Cause I feel like, I feel like, you know, I went to NYU. I know so many NYU people. It's just like, but you meet like one person like Nikki Atu, Jusu, and then next thing you know, you're friends with her friends who, um, you know, I think it's important that you just, you do seek out people, you can seek out people, you know, even if, especially now with Twitter. I mean, one of my best writer friends in LA, I met on Twitter, you know, we were both, I was in Toronto, she was in London, and then we were in LA and we're like, let's get together. And that, you know, relationship has created so much. So, you know, I do think it's easier when you come to the place, if you're in LA or in New York to like start to try to like, you know, do the, all the fellowships and the, the, you know, all the people I've met at Tribeca and TIFF and, you know, and eventually your your family kind of grows, I think. I agree. I feel like um, seeking it out at places like festivals, you know, like I was an intern at Urban World when it first started, however mm -hmm. many years ago, and you meet other, you know, hungry, you know, curious people there um, who are kind of on the same level and want it just as bad as you. And, you know, like, I'm also, I'm very into DIY, you know, like knowing that there are two or three people who have the same interests. Maybe we need to meet up once a month and read, read and listen to each other's pages. Um, and if I hear something, I'm gonna let you know. Um, and growing with that, that to me is that principle of going where the love is because for many years, very much like my character, I was looking in a certain direction for love. Um, and I feel like I was trying to make people love me and make people love my work, as opposed to pivoting my head and looking at the people who may not have had the pedigree or cachet of those other folks, but had the passion and they were invest invested and they mm -hmm. had the vision. They saw something in me that I couldn't even see. Whereas I'm over here knocking on this door constantly, these people like the door is open. So it's like, cultivating relationships with people who give a damn about you and what mm -hmm. you want to say in the same way that you you do um, and that you can give to in the same way. Um, you know, I, and I'm sure this happens to the both of you. You do a panel and afterwards you're kind of crowded by young people who want you to be their mentor. And um, it's just not possible because of, of the time, you know, and maybe relationships you're already trying to nurture outside of these, you know. Mm -hmm. And what I always say to them is like, you know, I always play this kind of joke with them. And I say, what city do you live in? And they're like, oh, I live in Ohio. And I was like, oh, what part of Ohio? And they're like, I live in Columbus. I'm like, oh my God, I think I know somebody there. Where do you live? I live on Orchard Street. I know somebody on Orchard Street who would be a great mentor for you. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. I said, what's your address? One, two, three, Orchard Street. Oh my God. 
they live right in your building, you know? <laughs> and then the idea is that look in the mirror, really, yeah. seriously, because I've put, I've invested so much in my mind on someone who I've been fantasizing, fantasizing about being my mentor and taking me under the wing. And then I meet them and they're like, fuck off. You know what I mean? But <laughs> nobody knows better than you what you need, what you want and need. Mm -hmm. And so like, if it's about, you don't go to school, create your own curriculum. I used to go to the performing arts library at Lincoln Center um, because, you know, I was a student or a young artist. I couldn't afford a $75 ticket to theater. The minute those shows close, there is an archive of it in the library. So I would study there or I would just make sure I went to cinema two, three times a week. I'm reading books. I'm asking people like, what did you read? Blah, 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 blah. Because um, I just think it's faulty to put, you know, a, a, a lot of weight on another human being right. when they don't know you. They may not be the right fit, even if they have the credentials, even if they make the movies like that you want to make, mm -hmm. they may personality wise, you may not gel. So it's like, yes, it's great when you can cultivate that community, mm -hmm. but it kind of goes back to what Stella was saying, you know, earlier It's like, ultimately you have to trust yourself and your needs because the things outside of you may fail or may not be available, you know? So um, I'm a big fan of the DIY, you yeah. know, process. I know I always feel bad when I look at some of the DMs or, you know, and it, it just kind of reminds me to like one of the first trips I took to LA and, if, and I remember I was going on this meeting and I was like nervous and my friend said to me like, don't be nervous. Like a meeting is just like two people coming together to mm. see they have a common goal. And if you have a common goal, then that meeting will be fruitful. If you don't have a common goal, you won't speak again. And that's, even at this level of my career, that's something I, I've always taken forward, you know, like mm. coming up, you do have to understand if you're sitting across from someone that you can't do something for, there's not a lot they can do for you either. Mm. Um, mm. And so that's where that lateral networking comes because that DP coming up needs you because he needs a, a film under his belt. Right. You know, that actress needs you because she needs to update her reel you know, and that's why that that works that way because you're all invested, like Rana said, in each other. Yeah. But when, if you are sitting at home, you know, wanting to write, bumping into Shonda Rhimes is not going to happen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she the, doesn't have anything for you, unfortunately. And the, you know what I say to people who, who have that reaction, like, can you please? Sometimes I say, you know, look around the room. Just look around. We're all here wanting the same thing. Like, you're not the first person to ask this of me or Shonda or Lulu or Stella, you know what I mean? Like, don't bet on that. Just don't, because it's faulty. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it, it's like that one in a million chance that Shonda's going to turn around and go, oh my God, I know, I haven't read your script, but I know that you have, I mean, like, that's, that's the wishful thinking, like, yeah. yeah. You'd probably be suspicious. <laughs> yes, yeah, like, wait. <laughs> Why you you wanna but you don't know me? Okay, you know what? Yeah. Go back to your drink. I'm sorry. I'm gonna go over yeah. here. <laughs> All that stuff comes back around. Like I always like to say the nose. You know, if you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing and you keep growing in your career, those people will be then calling your agent five years later begging right. you to come to a project that you don't have time for. You know, like it's you it's that's just the way things go and you continue to work and maybe you'll come back and then you'll be at the you know same point to need something from each other or, or you know maybe you won't yeah and i think there's so much power when i was younger i didn't have um this kind of power because i would so i would also be knocking on doors and trying to get people to approve of me or somehow mm -hmm. open the door and there's so much power that comes with just letting the work speak for itself mm -hmm. it's just like here here's a link here's a and then you forget about those people. You know, if they come back, then great. Then there's something to talk about. If not, you keep doing your thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most empowering thing for um, an artist at any level, whether you've made 10 films or you're working on your first film. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanna talk a little bit about what the breakthrough moment was for you guys. Um, Cause you talk about, you know, not, uh, like learning to not knock on doors and doing the stuff yourself. And um, I know that for me, it was 
like for the first moment was getting fired off of a major studio production where I was um, the assistant to a producer. And that was when I realized, you know, as long as I'm not taking the time to write and figure out my own voice as a filmmaker, I have nothing to show. I have, there's nowhere to go, right? And so what's sort of the, the moment where you were like, this is it, I gotta do this? Um, I feel like I just got kicked out of the US. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, no, I'd spent a year in LA trying to like make it um, and money had run out and I had to go back to Toronto in the dead of cold um, winter. And I just was like, I have to do this. I have no other choice. If I do not make Gina the Joneses, then I'm, I'm going to end up just going to work at a corporate job, you know, and mm -hmm. like, I'm broke. I'm at my mom's house. I need to figure this out. This is the want, life I want. I need to do this now. Um, and I just remember calling the producer on it and being like, we need to go back in for funding on telefilm. We need to, you know, try this again. And he's like, well, nothing's changed. And I was like, it doesn't matter if nothing's changed. Like, let's, let's tell them it costs less money to make it, you know? And he's like, but it doesn't. And I'm like, we're just going to say that. And if that's what it comes to, that's what we're going to figure out, you know, but all I know is if we come in and say that this budget is less, we're going to have a better chance of getting the green light from them. Um, and, and they did, they gave, they ended up giving us money based on the smaller budget. I had met, um, an independent, um, distributor through Canadian film center and Tribeca all access. And he agreed to come on as the, you know, as the distributor. And I remember my producer being like, they're not going to care. You know, they want, they want E1, they want like a bigger, you know, distribution company and I'm like no but this guy cares about me he cares about this mm -hmm. film he believes in it that's all we got so let's add him to the team um and that really helped push us over the edge with telephone to get the financing and then the two that 250 to get another 500 from someone else because no one wants to be first in mm -hmm. and then suddenly between that and you know the additional money that I took from a very strange source I took like a movie of the week budget um, and got them to agree to a year of a festival run before they aired it in the mm. US. Um, and it was a big sacrifice, but it got me the money I needed to, to, to do it. And so that really was a year where I just decided like, you know, by any means, you know, with any funding, like, you know, cobble together this funding and just, and just figure it out. And, um, yeah, you just reach that point where I feel like you decide I'm not good. I'm not the person I want to be, and if I don't do this right now, I'm never going to be. I, I, it wasn't the exact, but that same feeling of like I have to go in this direction um, relates to what you were saying, Lulu. I got fired off of <laughs> my first screenwriting I, gig, and uh, first draft they loved it. Second draft they were blown away. Third draft, they got rid of my ass. You know what I mean? And I was I was devastated. Like I wish people would say, Oh, you're gonna get fired. It's just part of the yeah. you know, the journey. Um, yeah. because I thought like this meant I'd never work again. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, so I was devastated and um I have a friend, uh Adipero Oduye, who's an actress, and um, you know, she she needed to be on tape for something, and so she called me and was like um, you know, can you be my scene partner and also direct the scene? And so we we met up in a little studio by her house. It was, we were taping on her iPhone and she had this tiny little tripod that she had the iPhone on. And so I'm reading lines and also directing her and I'm looking at her on the screen and I'm like, oh shit, like I, you can really make content at any time <laughs> with any resource, all you really need is an iPhone. And that's when I was like, you know what? I'm gonna make a web series. That's it. I'm gonna make a web series. I'm gonna put it online. You know, like I, I need to have a job that I can't be fired from, <laughs> you know? Um, and and you know what, to make sure that this thing happens, I'm gonna write it, I'm gonna direct it, I'm gonna star in it. So none of those people are getting fired. <laughs> those people are always gonna have their job. Um, so 40 Year Old Version started as a web series. 
And um, yeah, so it was that adversity that fed, fed what I think was going to happen inevitably, but at that particular point, it had to happen because I just felt like, you know, relating with, to what you're saying, Stella, I was like, I cannot keep going down this road where I am pitching and, you know, um, getting invested in story and people keep saying, no, not for me. Thank you. But blah, 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 blah. So it was like, it was also the, the beginning of my life as a producer, you know, like it's like, okay, I know I want to make it happen. I'm not going to wait for someone to come along and give me permission. I'm just going to do it myself. And I mean, it's a long story as to how it went from the the web series to then a pilot to then a feature length black and white 35 millimeter film. But that was the pivotal moment for me was someone saying, no, thank you. You just go along now. And I was like, nah, uh -uh. nope. <laughs> yeah. And so like, you you talked about this at Miami Film Festival. I remember of like going from a studio project where you didn't have control with what you felt like it wasn't in your voice and going back into the indie form. And so it's like you can go back to that. There's It's not just early in your career. There's always moments. Mm -hmm. and can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, Gina the Joneses, my first film I'd held for so long, right? Like, that's that film you kept with you. Like, I'd written for like eight years before I made it. And so you put your whole heart into it. And then you jump into the studio system. And it can be a very different process, especially early in your career, when you're afraid to say no to things, you know, going with the flow. Um, and so after my first studio film, I just felt very much like, well, who am I, you know, like mm. the Jones is like a fluke, like, is that voice gone? Is that just, am I one of those people who only have one story to tell? Like, you know, I was just going, I, I was really stressed because I knew the filmmaker, like I fought to be, and I was like, I don't think, you know, it looks like I'm on that path still. So that was very much like, I just wanted to make something, you know, to like, and I'd had that film the weekend written for a, a long time. Like I'd act, I'd, writ, I'd written it before I directed Gene of the Joneses because I thought that would be an easier film to make because it was like one location with a few characters. And I'd gone through different iterations too of it. I'd sold it to BT as a pilot, TV pilot. I'd had a TV version, you know, and um, that didn't go. And so I just was sitting on the script. So I ended up talking to Stephanie Elaine and she was like, this is, this, we can do this. We can figure this out. And we found the money and it was just, I remember being so terrified the night before shooting because I was just like, oh my God, what if I'm a hack? You know, like what if this isn't gonna work out? You know, you're having PTSD from people on set, just like not trusting you, you know? So you're questioning mm -hmm. yourself. Um, and I would just been so instinctual on my first film. So it was really like the weekend was really a like kind of confidence building and, you know, building back up your confidence that it's like, no, I have a voice. I have a very specific thing to say. Um, I have very specific black women stories to tell. Um, and so that kind of erased all the like chips on my shoulders, honestly, mm. that didn't need to be there. But on your second film, you're just, you know, not sure um, where it's going. So that definitely just, it just helped to be back in an environment where you're the final say on the, on the cut, on the casting, on the, you know, it's just all you and you're like, oh, right, my instincts work. You know, this is fun. Mm -hmm. um, people like this, <laughs> people see themselves in this. Uh, and and so that was, that was like invaluable to go and do that film after doing um, my second film. Uh, and then going into the photograph, it was a little easier to like, you know, make those decisions and try to hold on. It's still way more compromises than doing an independent film on your own. Um, but I, I was better at trying to balance that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the big question I have because I haven't worked with a studio yet and I have a couple different things and, and it's it's about, yeah, how do you maintain your own process, your own confidence, um, your own team, which I think is connected mm -hmm. to all of that. If I have my people that I make the farewell with, then I'm, you know, we have a way of communication um, where we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. But how do you preserve all of those things 
in different spaces, you know, whether it's a Marvel movie or a, a Netflix or Amazon TV series or whatever it is. And I think that can be challenging. Yeah, it's, bring, it's like what you're saying, it's bringing that team. Cause I found now, no matter the situation, I'm kind of gonna have a good time on set because like, you just know there's certain key members that you're not willing to take their their person. It's not, you don't wanna make it them versus you, but sometimes it is. And you just yeah. have to make sure it's like, I need this editor, I need this DP, I need this, you know, certain, certain roles, you have to just be on your team and you know that you're over in your village making the art you wanna make. Um, I think it, that's when it gets sketchy when you're like on set by yourself with mm -hmm. people who are working for other people. For the studio, yeah. 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 You know what's so interesting about that to me? I haven't had that experience yet. I, you know, I'm still dealing with this indie film um, is, you know, you make something that the industry says is of merit that they, oh, for this first time filmmaker, they put it all in there. They made great choices. And yet when you move into the studio system, there seems to be more questions about yeah. your ability. Yeah. It's like, I made this with less money. I was able yeah. to pull this off. And when I say pull this off, I'm also talking about casting. Like I found the right people. Right. You know, I, ha I made good choices around who is going to elevate the script. And now that I'm in this other house, mm. people think I'm going to set it on fire. Yeah. I didn't burn my house down. <laughs> I didn't set that shit aflame. Yeah. And yet for some reason, you think I'm just going to be putting matches to curtains right. in your house. Um, so it's just interesting to me, like when I see, um, I'm, and I'm studying, I study you guys, trust me, like the, the person who makes the that first independent film that people love. And then as they transition into the system, there seems to be less trust, even though <laughs> right. you made this, you know what yeah. I mean? I mean, I mean is that what you're dealing with, Stella? Like I mean, I feel like I got some advice when I first got to town and at the time I didn't know what he was talking about. Like, you know, but I real but real I realized now was like the best advice I ever got. It was they were like, people in this industry will hire you for your voice because they love your unique voice. And then they will systematically try to take it off of, out of everything you do. Yeah. And he was like, your ability to succeed will depend on how much of you you can keep on every page. Ooh. And that's the truth because they will, out of fear, a lot of the stu you know, studio system will, will be like, no, that person doesn't make sense and that we need to, <laughs> We need this actress, or we need. <laughs> He's about to say something. <laughs> Let me hold it back. Um, you know, this actress because they have a hundred million Instagram followers, and we need right. to be because they've done this movie. And we need, but like now they're draining every little piece of uniqueness out, of every piece of your voice out of what you're doing, and you're going to be left with nothing. And when that movie isn't good because you've agreed to go the generic route, they are not going to come back to you and be like, well, we told you, you know, like mm. I've had students I've had where they're like, during the development process, they're like, this isn't working, take out this scene, this doesn't work, oh, we don't like this, and you're taking them out. And by the time you get to the previews, people are like, we feel like there's something missing. And you're like, yeah, that fucking character you asked out of this right. movie is missing now. And that <laughs> storyline that you thought was messy that actually gave my movie nuance, Right. It's now gone and it's Texture. basic. And no yeah. one will ever come to you at the end of that process and be like, man, I gave you the wrong notes or I get, you know, I gave you the wrong this or that. They're just like, kind of just like run away from you and just like leave you holding the bag. So that's something I'm still learning and dealing with because the, the pressure is just so heavy of people being so sure that that's just some indie thing that she wants to do. Um, let's drain that out of her and make it this, you know, big commercial, you know, mess. Yeah. And I think that's part of the process. Um, after you have an indie film that is successful, that people don't um, anticipate necessarily, which is that a lot of people might say they love you. And then you kind of got to go, wait, but did they really love me? Or do they love the hype? Do they, right. and do they want, do they actually want, because you they, have shine, there's right. a shine on you. Right. We want to, we want, we want that shine too, but not yeah. too we want much that of it. Name. We you know? want to look like, 
you know, but because then when you actually, you sometimes mm. it's too far down the road, you start to engage and then you're like, wait, wait, what do you mean I can't bring this person or that person? Wait, what do you mean you, right. you, know, you said you love me, but you, you don't love me this, like this, or this or this about me, you know? And it's like, well, how do you think that I could have done the film that you say you love without all of these elements? Without me, without yeah, the without me. me without, exactly. I, I have a friend who um, had a pilot that, you know, the networks, cable networks were, were fighting over and they were just like, this is such a unique idea. And then she went into the process. She chose one, you know, she went with one platform and I'm not lying to you. The pilot after she had taken all of their notes was something completely different. And they said, no, thank you. Yeah. She took their note Ugh. and they cut her off anyway. Yeah. She took all of their notes. Yeah. And now the thing yeah. that she was holding looked completely different. They didn't want it anymore. Yeah. So I just, I, I was so, in so much pain for her because this was a yeah. big deal that exactly. all these people were fighting for her. She had completely compromised her voice and now they didn't want her. Yeah. So it's just, it almost feels yeah. like to be in this process, you have to, you, yes, you have to be willing and open to hear what people say, but you still have to hold on to the thing yeah. that makes this thing what it is, you know? I, and I that, like that, that is tiring. It is, because I feel like I get the feeling they want you to fight. They want, because they really just need to be convinced <laughs> so that they can tell other people, I'm convinced, I'm as passionate, you know, but there's this weird line where convincing them becomes, she doesn't want to listen or, you know, and you have well, to be able difficult, to engage right. yeah. in that. But, there's, but that is like heartbreaking because that happens over and over where you're like, trying to be collaborative and then what you're left with is half of what you started with and the collaboration is such an important part of the process but you're collaborating around a singular vision mm -hmm. and that's where i think that balance gets weird it's like you know like i know that many people came together to help me make my film but the constant thing was me and my voice yeah. you know what i mean and i found at times that um because of my gender and my race, when I would challenge people and say, no, I don't want that or that isn't good enough. Like, and this is this is me stepping into what you said, Stella, like not being afraid to be the bad guy, like not making my voice soft so that um, it's not, it doesn't sound like I'm demanding. Is it okay that I want, no, I was just like, mm, I'm not feeling that. Yeah. The response would be, well, I'm just here trying to help you. And I'm like, wait a minute, I yeah. thought I hired you. How did you, yeah. how is it now that you make me feel bad about holding on to my ideas. So that is where I feel like you need community, maybe a good therapist, and just a reminder. <laughs> I don't know if it's a piece of paper on yeah, your yeah. mirror that says, this is the idea, don't lose this. Right. That's what I feel like we have to hold on to because people are gonna tear away. People who've never had that idea or never even made a film, now all of a sudden know what it is that you're making better than you. It's a weird yeah. place to be in, yeah. The, the, the thing I got all the time in the beginning with my first feature was uh, when I would demand something, well, you're being a five-year-old. Stop acting like a child. Ooh. I was like, would you say that if a man? Never, they would just do it. I'm yeah. like, I'm not stomping my foot. I'm not even screaming. I'm just saying, I really need this thing. Because I, 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 I need <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Lulu. No. Because you need it. I mean, I once had a producer say, Stella, you don't have to start at a 10. I said, I started at a two. Two months ago, right. yeah, right. I'm at a ten because I've been saying the same thing over and over for two months now, um, and 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 he didn't want to admit that, but I'm just like, that is so much of what it is. I I feel like very when I speak in a normal voice, not even a soft voice, a normal voice, it's gone. It's so unheard so much of the time, right? That like no one actually hears what you need and what you want to do till it almost sounds like a tantrum because you're literally yelling, you know, yeah. because you have to like get to a 10 with someone for them to be like, oh God, she's serious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, we're running out of time. So I'm going to ask one more question um, very quickly and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Um, I want to talk a little bit about translating a personal story onto screen. Um, whether it's directly autobiographical, the way that your film is Rada and the way my film is on The Farewell, 
or Stella, you've talked a lot about um, how you bring your family into every movie that you make in some version of that. So can you talk about like, how do you separate the real life from uh, what you're creating, um, especially when it's like super, super close? And do you feel the need for that separation or is it better when everything's meta and on top of each other? Um, I crave the separation. Um, you know, my my family, my mom, my brother, my dad, they show up in different ways in the film. Um, but I, I feel for me to really make a concise, and my film is two hours and I'm not ashamed of it. I can say that, hi, my name is Rada and my movie is two hours long. Um, uh, that's another conversation. But, you know, like for it to be a concise thing, I really had to start tailoring it to the character and their need and journey yeah. as opposed to my own. So there is a blurry line. You know, there are some things that actually happen to me and there are real people who show up in the film, but for it to be a story, I just at some point have to decide like, oh, well, this isn't actually even about me. This is about the character and their journey. And that generally happens when I start bringing, bringing other actors on, you know, because they're playing a character, you know what yeah. I mean, in my, my film. So it helps to, create some parameters around like, well, what do I need for the character to get from A to B as opposed to using, mining my own personal story? Um, yeah, I feel like once I start the casting process, you know, I mean, I'm sure you both have dealt with this, that when you're on set, you think you've done all your rewrites on the script, on the script, and then people will say things a certain way. You're like, oh, wait, 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 I need to adjust. But so there's some carving there, but it definitely starts when the other actors come in, um, where I start to then separate myself from what's real and what's in the script. Yeah, I feel this. I feel the same way. I mean, Gene of the Joneses was closer to my real family, but it was um, obviously embellished um, all over the place, and the characters were kind of made. I don't want to say bigger. I feel like the women in my family are pretty big, but. Um, I just always think it's great to to start with an inspiration for each character from someone you know, or, you know, like it just makes it more personal and more grounded. Um, but as it gets more polished, as, and I think as Rada said, as the casting starts, I start to, I start to kind of, I mean, when someone shows up and says the words, it, it just changes, you know, yeah. it just changes. Like in the case of Gina the Joneses, I was like imagining this Zadie Smith, you know, American Zadie Smith, and then Taylor shows up and does a pirouette in a audition, and I'm like, oh wait, this is her, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to make you know bend this character to her personality so that and and because otherwise I feel like you're constantly trying to you know you're going to be giving line reads to some actor to do yeah. it, and that's not directing, so it's like yeah. you know you have to you know let them find the character and grow with them and you have to you have to grow with the movie or else right. you know the page is the page it's not you know what that final product is was it harder for you rada on on your film um to name the character after yourself you're playing yourself cuz i get that question all the time mm -hmm. for the farewell where i cast aquafina but i renamed the character billy um in order to feel that separation to go okay mm -hmm. this is actually not me mm -hmm. um so I'm just curious how you found that when it is you. Well, you know, like I'm a big fan of mockumentaries. Like Christopher <laughs> Guest is a god to me. And so I just, I, you know, I, I played with that. I mean, even in terms of like how Eric and I created choreography around how the camera shows up, you know, there are a lot of winners, the camera's swinging a lot. Uh, you know, I wanted it to feel like the, the camera was another person who just happened upon a conversation. So we do borrow from mockumentary style. And in that regard, like, I, I don't mind sending up myself, you know, it's just in terms of like really earning certain plot beats. Like I had to create certain things and step away from certain things. And again, the casting, I feel like that's such a huge um, process. Same thing. Once I hear people saying stuff, then I'm like, Oh, this has nothing. This is this is me, but it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with me creating this arc in this story. Um, but yeah, like I, um, one of the things that was so exciting about the process is 
I feel like I'll be, I'll become a better director the more I relent and let go of things. Um, I will not be in the next movie. I don't think I'll be in another movie that I direct because I don't, I'm not a fan of going crazy um, as a result of being in a film, but, um, or playing 14 different roles. But, you know, like, I feel like as I progress, I'm going to get better uh, at letting go of things, you know, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I have a particular character in the film who's not very verbal. And yeah, we could have sat down and I could say, well, he says this because, but it really, I felt good that I hired an actor that I trusted to kind of color in all the things that they could not get from me. You know, like I, I now see actors as my co-authors, you know, and, and my job is to kind of empower them in, in taking ownership mm -hmm. of stuff like that. And again, that then once they've got their tentacles in it, I definitely, it's not about me. It's about the story we're building together. So I'm, I'm really excited to not be in my next movie because <laughs> I, I feel like I can really kind of hunker down and, you know, make it about this picture I'm building um, mm -hmm. and stand outside of it and be, mm -hmm. be of even more service to the actors and the mm -hmm. other artisans in the, in the filmmaking process. Right. Um, okay. I'm going to take the first question uh, from the audience and, and um, what qualities do you look for when you're considering a project to direct? Um, the scripts. <laughs> Um, I guess it starts with this. No, I would say actually it starts with the team going back to what we were saying. Um, mm -hmm. It definitely starts with like, okay, who are the players? Who's the producer? Who's the studio? Like, um, does what the kind of filmmaking I want to do match up with that? That's probably where I would start today. Um, and then, and then if it's, if I'm not writing it, what's the script? I don't really tend to want to do anything that feels like it needs to start over. If I'm not writing it, it has to feel like I read it and I love it. Um, and I wish I wrote it and I'm mad at who wrote it. <laughs> um, or, um, or is this a story that I want to stick with that I'll be willing to like, you know, really sit down and write and, and like have enough love for it to like stick with it for so many years. I mean, it's all relatively new for me, <laughs> but, um, and I hope to, direct a script of mine the next time I do this, but just a fresh idea, like something that has me on the edge of my seat, you know, that's like, well, what, okay, what are they going to do next? You know, a fresh idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think for me, it's, um, I always look for things that are complicated mm -hmm. where you think you're, you're siding with one character and then and you're like, that person is horrible. And then suddenly you're on the other side, you know, where it really explores mm -hmm. the nuances mm -hmm. of multiple perspectives. Um, okay, here's another question. How do you choose the right DP and what is, in your opinion, the right way to collaborate creatively with them? How did you choose? Um, I chose, I worked with Eric Bronco on this and I'm not gonna lie, part of it is because he's from the Bronx <laughs> and he had such a passion, like he was so invested in telling a New York story from a different angle. You know, we've seen the, the, the New York story about the down and art, down on our luck artist, but not where the camera was angled on us in a particular way. So, but, but Eric is an actor's DP, you know, like even though we're shooting in black and white and it, I mean, I feel like it looks really beautiful. Aesthetic was not the, the thing leading us. It really was just about being honest. Again, we're shooting in kind of a documentary style. And so I needed a DP and I needed his an entire team that could respond to the impulses of the actor, like really read what was happening in the scene and know where to go next. Um, so that's what that was part of it. It's like Eric has an obsession um, with portraiture um, and black and white film. And so you know, that mm -hmm. definitely lends itself to the aesthetic, but really it was his passion for telling a New York story mm -hmm. that won me over. He had an investment that other people just, because they're not from there, from not from here, I'm not in New York right now, but because they're not from there, they're outsiders and that's fine. But he was like, from the very beginning, very in it, if, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with different DPs over different movies and it's, 
I think it's just finding the DP that they, you know, it's the, the, the lighting you like, the, the, you know, the, the, the way they shoot, you know, you know, when are they, you know, doing this perfect portrait or are they great at these handheld stories or it just depends on the movie and what it calls for and mm -hmm. finding the DP that is going to speak to that rather than having them kind of bend to a style that's not necessarily their instinct. Um, and then also like, can you sit with them for like two hours? <laughs> have a conversation. Like, I feel like to hire a DP, we have to have talked for four hours yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and feel like the style is right for it because that's the person on set you cannot not get along with um, uh, unless you want to hate your life for however long you're shooting. Right. Um, so to me, that's my person, that's my road dog partner. So you really have to be able to speak the same language. Yeah, I think communication is everything. It's, uh, you know, it's somebody, a, a DP once told me that um, we don't all see the same color green. So I mm -hmm. could say green and it could be a different, I could have a different mm -hmm. image than what somebody right. else is imagining when they hear the word green. Right. So we, we can't make the assumption that just because you say green, everyone sees the same thing. Mm -hmm. and so it, it really is about those nuances of language and that there, there's somebody that is emotionally intelligent enough to translate what, if I say, I want this to feel lonely, what does that look like mm -hmm. on screen? And can we mm -hmm. have a conversation about how we're going to make that visual? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because yeah, you do spend so much time and I think so many people now can make pretty images. Yeah. So I think it's always really difficult for me, like looking at reels, because it's like, this is beautiful, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So what, like, what, what do you pretty say? Pretty ain't enough. Yes. That's yeah. what I always say, pretty ain't enough, because any, right, anyone can kind of capture a beauty, but mm -hmm. like, how, who is going to really see the humanity or the vulnerability or the or these other things that aren't necessarily pretty, right? Or aesthetically and, and pleasing? Who's, and, and who's going to be um, vulnerable with you? Because right. that very that relationship, if you're not able to be vulnerable with each other in that relationship to admit oh, this isn't working or this we're trying to find and you're trying to find it, if you're not with someone you can trust mm. um, and that you can just find something together without egos coming into it. It's just like, you know, mm -hmm. that that's the key. Like, so that I can really, cause you're not gonna always exactly know all the time. Sometimes you get into a scene and you thought it was gonna be a certain way and then it's just not gonna flow that way because of the location or because of the, the day player or, you know, and you're gonna have to be able to like, you know, be able to talk with each other. Yeah, and to be flexible so often, you know, you might have like the perfect plan, but then you get on set and the conditions change, the weather changes, yeah. you run out of time and you have to both be adaptable. And if you yeah. speak the same language, you can have a shorthand and go, yeah. oh, instead of a five page scene, what if we just do this? You know, and we, we just right. let them look at each other or we just tell it in one hug mm -hmm. and in one shot. And sometimes that's the best stuff that comes out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Okay, Faye is asking to all three of us, is there something you wish you had not done on your path today? Not done. I don't know. What do you? I don't have any regrets. I feel like there's things I wish had gone better, but that I knew I know why I did them, so I don't I don't regret them. I feel the same way. Um, I had a moment on set that I maybe thought was my greatest failure. And uh, I cried all the way from Brownsville, Brooklyn up to the top of Harlem. And, um, but the next day I showed up and I was like, oh shit, that's what it is, showing up, that's it. So there was no mistake. Like the mistake is an opportunity to kind of prove to myself, like how bad do I want this? How, how invested am I? So I don't, I don't know this, I don't actually have any regrets because they're all lessons that mm -hmm. I could use. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think the one thing, there's not stuff I would do differently, but there's stuff that I wish I had a different reaction to if I knew then what I know now kind of mm -hmm. thing, where I think 
Um, in my younger days, I was much more easily convinced that centering someone that looks like me would is just quite obviously not the way because many less mm. people would relate and um, it would obviously make the film a much higher risk. And even, you know, and I don't think I had the power to fight those battles back then, but I, I think it's more like mm. internally, I believe that, you know, when people would say that it was like, right, right, right. Well, of course. And, you know, how mm. can I never made anything, not only expect somebody to uh, invest in me and partner with me, but then also take on this additional risk mm. of allowing me to make a film that actually centers someone. So yes, 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 of course, you know, and I just wish yeah. now that, because I think it affected how I saw myself, how I saw my own community for so long. And I wish that I wasn't that brainwashed, I guess. Mm. Mm. Do we have time for one last question? Okay, I'm just gonna ask it, because uh, I think this is a really important question and this will be our last question. On stressful days when you sadly do have to deal with people who are not listening to you on set, how do you de-stress? How do you take care of yourself? Self-care. I don't know. I listen to a lot of Travis Scott <laughs> on the way to set. <laughs> um, I listen to jazz when I get to set, but on the way to set, um, you kind of you like get in height, you hype yeah, yourself up. myself up a little bit. No, music gets me through too. Sometimes I'll make like a playlist for a project. <laughs> Um, because I, I'll need to speak through different people, um, but also community, like just lean yeah. on, you know, people like Stella, people like Liesl, people like Terrence Nance, like, you know, knowing that I'm not alone in this fight, that we've yeah. all had our ups and downs. And um, so community is really, really mm -hmm. crucial. Definitely makes you feel like you're not alone. Yes. And that everybody's being treated like this. <laughs> right. Yes. So that you don't go crazy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the main thing is when you're in like, especially on set, you feel like you're in a bubble and right. it, like it can be so easy to take everything super personally, like it's about mm -hmm. you, you know? And so it's oftentimes when I'm in these battles, I make the mistake of not having these conversations in the moment, but it'll mm -hmm. be like much, much later at a film festival or whatever. And you talk to another filmmaker and they're like, oh, I dealt with this, whether it's a company or a person or just a, that particular situation. You're like, oh wait, you did you dealt with the I just thought it was me, you know? And you just right. it has to realize that it's not personal. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Especially well, when like everybody is looking at you, you know, with that look, right? Like because they just want to get home I or I can like, do right, or <laughs> I can do a better job than her. Like that, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I've been in that moment where it's like 50 people all staring and they're like, you know. And, and having to just ignore it and push through, like yeah. we've all been there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this was so much fun, such a pleasure, such an honor. Thank you for moderating, Lulu. Yeah, this was awesome. Yeah. Oh, thank you guys. Uh, I hope you take care, continue to take care and stay sane and, uh, and stay safe. See you on the other side of this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tiff. Thank you, Stella. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Lulu. Lulu. This was awesome. All right. All right, guys. Bye. Take Bye. care. Bye.